Schools Project Seminar at UT Dallas. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have with us this morning Maddie uh, Mavrogodata from Vanderbilt University. And today we're going to be hearing um, Maddie present uh, regarding uh, her research, which focuses on the social context of schools, policy adoption and implementation, school leadership, with a special focus on English language learners and immigrant students. Prior to beginning her graduate work, Maddie was a bilingual elementary school teacher in, in, uh, in Texas and in South Texas and California. And today we're going to be we're going to be seeing her research on factor shaping English language learner reclassification. So Maddie's in the final stages of her doctorate uh, from at uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, and this fall, she's going to be launching her academic career at Michigan State University. We just learned. Uh, where she'll be an assistant professor in the Department of Education Administration. Ready? Thank you very much. Um, well, since we're a small and intimate crowd um, today, forgive me for hiding behind the, the lectern here. I have my notes on my computer. But please feel free to interrupt me to ask questions throughout the presentation. I'm happy to answer them um, as we go along. Um, and so, yes, today I'll be presenting some of the work that I've done here um, at UT Dallas. Um, about English language learners and the reclassification process with English language learners in the state of Texas. And so before I begin, um, I just need to, to thank a couple of people. My dissertation committee um, has really been instrumental in this work. I've received some excellent su support from the good people um, at the Education Research Center here at UT Dallas. Um, and the money that has paid uh, for me to do this work comes from the Institute of Education Sciences where I'm a pre-doctoral fellow. Um, and so I need to make sure that I acknowledge all of those uh, groups of people. Um, so as Greg mentioned, um, my work tends to focus in three areas. Uh, I look at policy adoption and implementation, the social context of education, and school leadership and school governance, particularly in terms of how these different sort of categories or bins, if you will, expand educational access and equity for disadvantaged students. And today I'll be talking about English language learners specifically. So, I'm sure most people in this room know what English language learners are, but I want to focus on a specific aspect of the definition that comes directly from the No Child Left Behind text. Um, so this very small, uh, uh, this, this little section um, of the No Child Left Behind definition says, obviously, these are children who have a native language that is one other than English. OK, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, the second part of this definition that I want to focus on is that these children have um, enough difficulty in listening, speaking, reading, and writing uh, of the English language such that that can impede um, their achievement and understanding in a mainstream English speaking classroom. I also need to note, I think it's interesting to note, um, if we look down here, I think this is an interesting part of the No Child Left Behind text, that these students may not have the opportunity to participate fully in society. I'm a little, that language to me is a little loaded, um, but that's the way that the text reads, and I think it's an interesting aspect of, of the text to point out. So there is a policy response when we classify English language learners, um, and that is that they go into a specific instructional setting. Um, they are taught, or they are supposed to be taught, by specially certified teachers who have experience working with students who are non-native English speakers. And they also tend to receive auxiliary language support services, for example, after school tutorials, summer school, so on and so forth. So why, why focus on English language learners? Why, why this group specifically? Um, first and foremost, there is longstanding um, lagging academic achievement between English language learners and students who are uh, fluent in English. And this gap is even greater between English language learners and those and, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's a greater gap for English language learners than it is for other subgroups that are focused on in No Child Left Behind. Uh, secondly, we've really witnessed a demographic shift. The state of Texas is used to having English language learners, but across the country, we're seeing English language learners be one of the most rapidly growing groups, and then we're seeing this aspect of diffusion. I'm in Tennessee right now at Vanderbilt University, um, and we have seen tremendous growth in Tennessee, upwards of 300%. Um, growth in our English language learner population. So this is a very new population in a number of states and a number of states that don't typically know how to best educate this group of students. Um, 
And also, uh, we should also think about English language learners because of the federal uh, performance accountability pressure that's being placed on schools and districts and states across the country. Uh, specifically, I wanted to focus on two aspects of the federal performance accountability pressure, and those are in the box at the bottom. Um, in essence, No Child Left Behind requires states to monitor the progress that students are making in learning the English language on an annual basis, and also to describe the number and percentage of English language learners who attained English proficiency um, as determined by a valid and reliable assessment of the English, uh, their performance in the English language. Okay, so why specifically focus on English proficiency for this group as opposed to the achievement of English language learners? So what we know is that limited English proficiency can be thought of as a gatekeeper for immigrant students. So immigrant students um, who have limited English proficiency uh, tend to have less exposure to academic content. Um, they also often are in classrooms with reduced academic rigor or in school settings with reduced academic rigor. Um, oftentimes there's stratified course placement or tracking that takes place with these students. I think sometimes that's um, very unintentional. I think sometimes it's because, because of the requirements with the courses uh, that these students have to take. Um, oftentimes these courses can conflict and can sort of put students on a certain educational trajectory. You can imagine that as counselors are counseling students into certain classes, if that child has English language learner um, in their permanent record, the counselor is going to think differently about whether or not they should put that child in an advanced English class, an, an AP math class, where there's a high level of English proficiency um, required uh, to succeed in those classroom settings. Um, English proficiency is also seen as a means of building bridging social capital. And what I mean by that, that's a term uh, that Robert Putnam uses. But what I mean by that is that um, with English proficiency, students can connect to groups that are unlike themselves. So non-native English speakers have the ability to bridge this gap uh, with native English speakers and acquire a whole host of social networks because of acquiring English proficiency. Um, and so, for example, this can, can really uh, shift the way that students are able to utilize key institutional supports. Um, if schools provide counseling, if they provide tutorials, if they provide the, these whole host of social services and academic services, if they're only provided in English, that really limits English language learners from taking advantage of those support services. Um, and it also allows students the flexibility to take risks, both in the classroom and in the hallway. One of the things I want to make sure that I point out is that um, English language learner, learning status is meant to be a temporary classification. And I, the reason I point this out is because when we look at this classification compared to every other subgroup in No Child Left Behind, this is the only one where students, where schools are supposed to help students transition out of this classification. So the transitioning out of this classification is a key aspect of seeing progress for this specific subgroup of students. So therefore, I would argue that a key outcome of interest for this group is the timing of when a student is reclassified during their educational career. So the specific research question that I'll be talking about today, which as Greg mentioned, comes out of my dissertation, is how do objective state assessments, student characteristics, and local contexts influence the rate of reclassification for English language learning students? There is actually very little research that has been done regarding reclassification of English language learners in terms of rigorous empirical research. Um, I'm trying to contribute to that literature, but there are a few studies that are, that are emerging and have been done in, in recent history. Um, so just to sort of mention a couple of these, we know that uh, students who remain English language learners for an extended period of time experience disproportionately high course failure rates, a lack of course credit accrual, increased dropout rates and reduced college entrance rates. And by extended periods of time, I mean upwards of five to seven years. They, are, they remain classified as English language learners even, after, even having been in US schools for five to seven years at that point. Um, we also know that um, being classified as an English language learner uh, tends to benefit students for a limited amount of time after arrival to the United States or beginning school in the United States. As we know, many English language learners have been born in the United States, so often it's not arrival but beginning school. Um, but that it can have a negative effect if they are retained as an ELL for too long of a period of time. There's a really interesting study that's been done recently 
that looks at reclassification as a treatment. Um, it uses a regression, a fuzzy regression discontinuity design, where in essence we say, okay, kids who are just above and just below the cut point for being reclassified, we can treat that as measurement error. So those students have been randomly assigned to either receive the treatment of reclassification or serve as a control group and remain as English language learners. And this work that has been done um, by, um, by Robinson recently, um, in essence what he argues is if we see when children are reclassified that their academic trajectory, their achievement suddenly goes up, that in essence what that means is they've been held as an English language learner for too long. If it suddenly declines, then they're no longer receiving the language support services that they needed to tick along in that educational trajectory that they had previously exhibited. And if it stays level, then they're being reclassified at approximately the right time in their educational career. This work comes out of the state of California and looks at uh, two school districts' data. So the contribution that I'm specifically trying to make with my dissertation, uh, so let's just think about uh, students going along an educational trajectory. They come in in kindergarten, hopefully uh, they graduate and go on to post-secondary um, uh, education. At some point um, in their career, English language learners are meant to be reclassified at some point. So what we know is that reclassification can be thought of as a, as a cause where uh, we know that reclassification, the timing of a child's reclassification um, can be a cause for uh, different sort of educational outcomes down the road, as I mentioned, course credit accrual, graduation, dropout rates, so on and so forth. But what we don't know um, is thinking of reclassification as the effect. So thinking of reclassification as the dependent variable as opposed to the independent variable. So what are the determinants of reclassification? Um, there are really two sort of bins um, of, of categories uh, that we should think about. The first are, are assessments. So generally speaking, English language learners um, take both English proficiency tests as well as achievement tests. And both of these factor into the decision as to whether or not they're reclassified. And then there's also this idea of subjective teacher recommendations and committee recommendations. Um, these are groups of people who meet um, at the school level to make decisions as to whether or not children are reclassified based on um, the assessment scores that uh, children have received as well as observations that these teachers have done in the classroom and their knowledge of the students. So just to sort of once again give you a, a summary of my conceptual model. So in essence we know um, that students have certain characteristics that are going to influence how they perform on assessments and that these assessments are going to influence uh, the teacher recommendations in terms of whether or not a child is reclassified. Teacher recommendations will factor into a committee decision and ultimately that committee will make the decision as to whether or not children are reclassified. Now, it would be great if everything worked in this nice neat, nice, neat little package, but we also know that uh, student characteristics can influence teacher recommendations and committee decisions outside of working through this line of assessments. That, that these teachers and committees may uh, take into account um, certain student characteristics above and beyond how students are performing on the assessments. We also know that assessments could independently influence the committee decision outside of teacher recommendations in this process. And all of this is taking place in a local context. And I think that that's important to remember because districts and regions work very differently from one another. Um, the other thing I want to make sure to make clear is that teacher recommendations and ultimately the committee decision, I do not have access to the language that's happening between teachers in terms of their actual recommendation. But what I do have, I do know student characteristics and I do know their performance on assessments, both in terms of achievement and English proficiency. And so if I'm able to net out the influence of those, I should be able to tap some of the teacher recommendations that are coming into play and how they're working through these other characteristics. Does anybody have any questions right now? Just pause for a second. Okay, if anything comes up, just let me know. So when I'm speaking specifically about assessments, just to flesh this out a little bit, like I said, there are two bins, English proficiency assessments and achievement tests. Um, English proficiency tests are required by No Child Left Behind. They must measure listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills in English. 
um, and they have been improved quite significantly under No Child Left Behind due to extensive piloting and field testing, and that's because of the requirement that No Child Left Behind has for re a reliable and valid assessment. That's actually included in the No Child Left Behind language. They're not perfect, but they're getting much better at actually measuring English proficiency. Um, and then in terms of achievement tests, um, achievement tests tend to be used by the vast majority of the states um, across the country to factor into these reclassification decisions. But a lot of folks who study language argue that these tests were designed to assess monolingual English uh, students' content area knowledge, for example, in reading or literacy, and that they're not designed to assess English proficiency. I heard, I read one of, uh, one of the scholars I read compared using these tests uh, to measure English proficiency, for example, using a reading test like the tax test to measure English proficiency akin to using a science test to measure mathematics knowledge. They've not been designed to measure English proficiency, but they're being used in that fashion, and not just in Texas, but across, across the country. So because of the emphasis that's been placed on standardized testing in federal legislation, um, assessment outcomes will likely be important predictors of the rate at which a child is reclassified. When I talk about student characteristics, I'm referring again to two different bins. The first are student demographics, um, gender, ethnicity, free and reduced lunch status, parent education. These are all powerful predictors of whether or not a child is reclassified, and that comes out of the literature. It doesn't talk about the rate or when the child is reclassified, but just that these factor into the ultimate reclassification decision. Um, also, in terms of educational profile, um, there's an overrepresentation of English language learners in special education classes, and there's an underrepresentation of English language learners in gifted and talented classes. Um, and so you can see how these educational profile aspects may also uh, influence the rate of the reclassification. So student demographics and educational profile may serve as signals uh, to teachers and to the committee in terms of making the decision as to when to reclassify an English language learner. When I talk about the local context, I'm talking both about the school context and the regional context. So for example, English language learner, English, English language learner representation in a school may influence the programs and services that are um, available in that school, and I think that that makes perfect sense. Um, having taught down in South Texas in the Rio Grande Valley, um, I was in an elementary school that served 800 children, and um, it was 100% Latino. I was uh, one of three Anglo teachers in the school. And um, it's a very different context when you're working in, in that kind of a context where that number of students are Latino and need English language support services. The services are much deeper and much vaster when you're in that kind of an environment versus when you're in a place where they may, there may be five or six English language learners in a schooling context. You can imagine that those services are going to differ tremendously. Um, and then in terms of regional context, we know that when immigrant populations grow, local governments and schools often evolve to accommodate the needs of that population. We're seeing this right now in Nashville as we've seen the growth in English language learners in, in, uh, in our city. Um, we also know that linguistic norms change when language minority populations grow significantly. We, we see that on the radio, we hear it on the radio, we see it on TV. These are shifts that take place outside of school but are, are part of the local context. So I would argue that despite a push to standardize reclassification criteria, districts and schools will continue to use other locally determined criteria to evaluate reclassification readiness of their students. Again, I'll pause for just a second and see if anybody has any burning questions. <laughs> Um, the context of the specific study that I've done, obviously, is the st state of Texas, because I'm using the data that's available to me here. Um, the state of Texas has a growing English language learner population. Um, approximately uh, 830,000 students were English language learners um, in the 2010 to 2011 school year in the state of Texas, which is about 17% of the students in the state. Um, this number uh, and the proportion is only second to the state of California. Um, and this number has, is, is continuing to increase. While this is a long-standing population in the state of Texas, again, the number continues to increase rather rapidly. More than a billion dollars is spent in Texas annually uh, providing bilingual and ESL programs um, to English language learning students. 
Um, and approximately 90% of the English language learners are Spanish speakers in the state of Texas, but more than 100 languages are represented. So, for example, um, Vietnamese is, uh, is um, a, a growing langu language in the Houston area where there's a growing Vietnamese population. So ELLs are identified um, in Texas first through a home language survey. And I know that the text here is, is very small, but let me come over here so I can read you exactly what the two questions are. Um, the first question is, what language is spoken in your home most of the time? And the second question, what language does your child or do you speak most of the time? Um, I have to point this out again. This is one of my little, <laughs> I think this is interesting because I've reviewed a lot of home language surveys from different states. Um, I think it's interesting that the state of Texas decided to put this sort of paragraph structure into this home language, or excuse me, parenthesis structure into this home language survey. Um, this language survey is translated into a whole host of languages. If it's not available in the specific language that the parents uh, need, it's required to be translated for the parents. Um, and so if parents indicate in either of those questions that a language other than English is spoken, then the child is flagged as a potential English language learner. Um, and so if they're flagged, then they, at that point, take an English proficiency uh, assessment. Um, this assessment measures oral proficiency in kindergarten and first grade. And then once students go into grade two, um, they're also assessed in terms of um, reading and writing with this English proficiency assessment. So depending on how they score on the test, they will then be placed in English language learner programs and will be classified as an ELL. Um, if they score at a point that is below a certain threshold that's set by the state. One of the things I need to mention is that the state of Texas is interesting in that the specific test is selected from a list of approved assessments. So the state has a list of a number of assessments, the Woodcock Munoz, um, the Telpas, um, the Tejas Ley, um, so on and so forth. There's a, just a whole host of, of assessments that can be used and it's up to the district to determine which assessment they're actually going to use. However, the cut points are also set by the state. So if, this, if the district uses X test, the cut point on that test has also been predetermined by the state. But it is interesting that the state of Texas does not use one assessment, but that they have a variety of, of assessments that the districts can choose from. Yes? When a student moves, do, does their um, classification follow? So if I move from Richard to the Plano? Mm -hmm. It does if um, their permanent record follows them. And it technically, it, technically it's supposed to, and in many cases it does. I think that that's actually improved. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be retested? No, no, no. Um, now, when we do run into issues are when students cross state lines. That's when it becomes a, a bigger issue, yeah. Especially because, again, states have different criteria for determining whether or not a child is an ELL. So even if they were tested at the exact same moment in both states, it could come up, they could come up with different results. Yeah. Yes? How, I may be jumping ahead of you, but sure. how, how much um, research has been done on the relationship between, say, TELPAS and the, the other, the various uh, norm reference tests? Or That's a great question. I haven't come across any. Now, I can tell you from running basic, um, well, I don't have access to the district tests that they use. I have access to the TELPAS. Um, scores, which the, I'll get into this in a minute, but the TELPAS is the um, English language proficiency, is the Texas English language proficiency assessment system that's used by um, all schools in the state for accountability purposes on, on No Child Left Behind. Um, but it does not necessarily match up with this list of approved assessments. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I'll get into some of my results, but um, one of the things that I find is that there's a huge amount of regional variation in terms of the rate of reclassification, and I think some of that is going to be driven by these different assessments that are being used. That's a great question. So, we'll yeah. That. Okay, great. So that's how English language learners are identified in Texas. In terms of reclassification, um, this takes place um, at the end of every um, academic year. Students are, are up for reclassification. It's normally about a one to two month window. March, April is generally um, the time of year that's, that uh, districts uh, look at reclassifying their students. And this decision is ultimately made by the Language Proficiency Assessment Committee, the LPAC. Um, and this committee consists of um, two uh, teachers who are bilingual educators or transitional uh, language educators. Um, a parent of an English language learner, and a campus administrator. Um, 
And I, I will note, oftentimes people ask me, well, what, what is the role of each of these people on the committee? Um, and while I have not done formal research looking at the roles, for example, of the parent of an English language learner being on the committee, having been a teacher who's been involved in this process, um, the parent sitting as a, the parent of an ELL on the committee is a highly symbolic gesture. I would, I would just argue that it's a symbolic gesture, that parents are appointed on this committee and that they just sort of rubber stamp things. Um, but it's, it's an interesting uh, movement that is not always the case across other states. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, um, the annual review takes place in the spring. Um, and what are considered, uh, according to state uh, policy, are uh, English language, an English language proficiency assessment um, and then the achievement test, the reading tax test, um, is considered, as well as teacher recommendations. So obviously the reading tax test is only, only going to come into play in third grade, which is when that test takes place. And I know we're moving to the star at this point, but the data that I've looked at uses the tax. Um, the reclassification goal that is set by the state of Texas is for students to be reclassified within three years of entering ELL. That's regardless of whether they enter in kindergarten or whether they enter in eighth grade into U.S. schools. I think that that's also an interesting um, sort of policy push um, by the state of Texas, but that is, that is what the, their, the goal is that is um, put forth. So um, some of you may have seen this chart. This comes out of um, the Texas Education Agency guidelines. But so as I mentioned, there are several criteria for um, exiting um, English language learner status. So the first, we have listening and speaking criteria. This is a test that the district determines. Uh, the second, we have the reading tax test that comes into play. Um, and it must be the English reading tax test, not the Spanish uh, that comes into play. So according to state policy, if the child tests in Spanish on the tax test, then they're not eligible to be reclassified in that year. They must pass the English reading achievement test, the tax test. Um, and then the uh, writing um, um, assessment that comes into play in years where the writing tax test is offered, they must pass the writing tax test um, in English. And then um, in years where it is not offered, uh, they have to pass a, an agency approved test. Again, that's from a list of assessments, but I can also tell you from experience that the test that they tend to use is the TELPASS writing test because they are required to use that test for accountability purposes anyway. So why pay for another test and give your kids another test when you already have one that you can use? So it tends to be the TELPASS writing test. And then this last little category here, teacher recommendations. So assessments, anecdotal notes, portfolios, et cetera. Sort of this black box of what, what that means. As uh, you all probably know, there are 20 um, education service center regions in the state of Texas. Um, these were established in 1967. And the purpose of these regions is to coordinate educational planning uh, for the region um, and to work with the, te the Texas Education Agency to raise the quality of, di of district programs. So just for the sake of um, comparison, on the left is a map that I created using U.S. Uh, Census Bureau data from the American Community Survey. It shows the level of linguistic isolation in an area. What that means is um, nobody in the household over the age of 14 speaks English very well. So in the areas that are darker, for example, in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, um, that means that there's a high level of linguistic isolation. So the reason that I, I, I show you this is just to say, when you think about the educational service center regions and what they do in Texas, these are very different um, regions. And you can imagine that what is happening in those regions in terms of coordinating efforts with English language learners are going to be very different depending on the concentration of those students in that area. Students and families also, I would say. Any questions before I go on to some of the nitty gritty data? So the data that I use comes from the Texas Schools Microdata Panel um, here at uh, UT Dallas. Um, this is a confidential longitudinal data set that contains information on students, teachers, administrators, and schools throughout the state of Texas. Um, it's student level data, which is the beautiful thing about it. Um, each student is assigned a unique uh, student identifier so we can track students across time. It's longitudinal. Um, and it's been collected since 1990, so it's, it's long standing, um, which allows me to track students for a number of years. 
and there's a sufficient sample size for me to use in this data because it's the state of Texas, there are a number of English language learners in this state. Uh, and I supplement this data with um, data from the common core of data from um, the Institute of Education Sciences in the Department of Education. When I talk about uh, measuring reclassification, which is my dependent variable, um, whether or not a child is reclassified is, is, is just a zero or a one in my data. So if students exit in a given year, they're assigned a one uh, for reclassification in that year. Otherwise, it's a zero. Uh, when I look at reclassification criteria, again, um, achievement tests come into play. So whether or not the child met the tax proficiency standards in that year, whether or not the child took the tax in English, and then an interaction effect between the two. Um, also, I look at um, English proficiency. So I include the TELPASS writing um, score. And what I do is I, I, I turned it into a dummy variable. The TELPASS is on a scale of one to four, going from beginning to advanced high. But the state requires for reclassification that students score advanced high on that test when it's used as the criteria. So I use it as a dummy variable, whether or not they scored advanced high. Um, and then uh, with language controls, um, I also include the TELPASS um, reading multiple choice um, assessment score as well as the TELPASS listening and speaking average rating. The reason I use an average is because the listening and speaking ratings are too highly correlated and I would have a multicollinearity problem if I included both of them um, in the equation. So the reason that these are controls, and this gets back to your question, I don't have the listening and speaking test scores because those are from a district determined test and those are not submitted and included in this data set. And because of issues right now with allowing me to match students and scores, I wasn't able to do that. Um, but so what I do is I sort of have a, a, best, um, uh, a best attempt to control for their listening and speaking scores using the TELPASS, which is provided to me. But, but you do have the reading scores, right? I have the reading TELPASS and I have the reading achievement. Yes, yes. I have the TELPASS for everything, but the issue is that the TELPASS is not the assessment that the districts use when they are making the reclassification decisions for the listening and speaking. Yeah, exactly. But I would think, I would argue, I would hope that they're highly correlated. That's another study to look at, as you were mentioning. Yeah. Um, with student demographics, gender, um, economic disadvantage status, whether or not the child is a migrant, and then I include native language dummies. So if the child speaks Spanish, if the child speaks English, if the child um, comes from a different language background, which again, that's that you know 100 plus list of languages. The reason English appears on this list is because there are actually a small number of English language learners in the state of Texas who have a native language that's listed as English. And the reason for that is because oftentimes when parents are filling out a home language survey, there can be a fear of sort of flagging yourself, especially when we're thinking about undocumented um, immigrant status. Um, and the issue is parents a lot of times are fearful of listing that they speak a language other than English on that home language survey. So sometimes they will say they speak English and that's where this data comes from. But then what happens is the child is put into class and the teacher says, wait a minute. <laughs> This child needs these additional support services. The child is then flagged for testing and classified as an English language learner. But that's where that comes from. Um, in terms of looking at student characteristics, again, with the educational profile, I include special education status, gifted status. If the child was retained the previous year, um, it's a lagged variable. The number of school switches that the child made during the year to account for mobility within the state of Texas. The years of public pre-K, the years of public kindergarten. Um, and language support program dummies. So as you know, there are a variety of language programs that um, Texas has. The data does not get into the specifics of the different kinds of bilingual programs or the different kinds of ESL programs, but um, this, this is what I'm able to look at. Bilingual English as a second language. If the child is a parent denial, meaning they've been flagged as an English language learner, but their parents have denied all the services, um, and they go straight into a mainstream classroom, and then no language support. These are uh, a very small group of students who are flagged as ELLs, they're not parent denials, and they're not in any kind of English um, language support classes. Yes? Can they go, can they be unclassified then reclassified? They can. It's a rare event, but that, that can happen. I'm looking at the first time the children are reclassified. Yeah. That's another study to do <laughs> down the road. Well, I'm just thinking somebody moving to a district where they have a a higher or a lesser standard or something they would I was thinking about that like 
a state that yeah. might, or even a district, they're more advanced. Mm -hmm. And then they might move back and get reclassified. The teacher looks at the things and wait a minute. Yeah. Back to zero. I think I think that's a great point. Um, I think it happens less in practice than we would think. One might think it does. Like again, that's one of those situations where, um, if a, if a teacher has a permanent record and they're looking at it and they see that the kid has been reclassified, the child is going to have to be, you know, I think really seriously struggling in in a class for for a teacher to flag that child, fill out all the paperwork go through reclassifying that child. It's just one of those things where it takes a lot of work on the teacher's part to make that happen. So I think consequently we see less of it than maybe we should, if that makes sense. Um, when I look at local context, I include uh, the percentage of students that are ELL in the school, the percentage of economically disadvantaged students, the total school enrollment in terms of students, uh, the average teacher tenure in the school, whether or not the school is a charter school, um, urbanicity dummy, dummy, so the context um, in terms of uh, population density, and the regional context, so the education service center regional dummies are included also in the variable, or in the, in the equation, excuse me. Um, the sample that I use uh, is the first grade ELL cohort of 2001 to 2002, and I follow this group through the end of seventh grade. Um, so my analysis, in fact, starts in the 2003 to 2004 year, which is when students are in third grade. The reason that I do that, there, there are two primary reasons. First of all, the tax test began in 0304, and I wanted to have a steady level of um, a steady measure of academic achievement being incorporated. Um, and then secondly, um, I start specifically uh, in this year because the tell pass also started in this year. And so again, I wanted a consistent um, measure of, of both achievement and of English proficiency. Um, you may ask, why not start with a third grade cohort? Um, why, why did I start with a first grade cohort and then start my analysis in third grade? And the reason for that is because I really wanted to make sure that I was only including students in this analysis who had started in U.S. schools, who had started in Texas schools and had been here since first grade, which is the first year of mandatory instruction in Texas. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm, I'm an education policy person, and when we talk to policymakers about this issue with English language learners, frequently the response that we get is, well, it's not, it's not us. These kids have just come in. How can we be held responsible for kids who just came in? You know, it's not our schools. But what I wanted to make sure that I was doing was analyzing children who had been here from the start to be able to, to, to really look at um, how, how things were happening in this state and not be able to sort of be dismissive. Um, in terms of my analysis, I use a, a method called event history analysis. Um, and so in essence, what that allows me to do uh, is um, measure the impact, the influence of time. Um, and so this is better suited than logistic regression uh, for answering the research question that I'm specifically interested in, which is this idea of rate of reclassification. Um, because I can use it um, I can include information not only on whether an event occurs, but when the event occurs in a child's uh, educational trajectory. Um, there's another reason also. Logistic re regression commonly omits any cases that did not experience the event at the end of the period of observation. So at the end of seventh grade, if students had not experienced the event, then they would have been eliminated from the analysis. And so I wanted to make sure that that was not the case, and so this method also allows me to account for that. Um, also, event history analysis allows for gaps or periods of non-observance. So if, for example, I don't have a test score for a child in one year, I can just eliminate that one year, that one record for that student, but include the student in the model the rest of the time. So that really minimizes my potential for um, selection bias. So just to sort of flesh out this data structure a little bit, Greg, how am I doing on time? OK, I'll wrap, I'll wrap things up. OK. Um, so just to sort of cover the data structure, um, uh, this is one student. Um, you can see student ID number one. Um, you can see the student going through the years, through the grades. This child is reclassified in sixth grade, so there's a value of one. Um, and I just wanted to make mention that I do not have then the seventh grade record for this child because the child was reclassified already. So once they're reclassified, they exit my sample. Um, child number two, you can see they are never reclassified the entire time they're under observance. So this child has been in U.S. schools from first grade and is not reclassified by the end of uh, seventh grade. And then finally, um, well, let me mention also, you can see I have a missing test score here in this year. So as I mentioned, this method allows me to just get rid of this one 
uh, period of time for this one record for this individual student, but the student remains in the analysis for every other year. Um, student number three, I only have one record because that child was reclassified in first grade. Just to sort of make, try to help people visualize that a little bit. Yeah. What happened in your cohort for students that exited after second grade? If they exited after second grade, um, all of my students who are in the sample exited after second grade. No, since you track, you are starting uh -huh. to track from third grade onwards, mm -hmm. and your cohort starts in first grade. That's right. In one over. So what one. happens to students who are reclassified in first yeah, or so second grade? There's a large proportion of kids that exited your cohort already. It's not a large portion. It's actually a very small portion. Um, the vast majority of students are not exited until beginning in third grade. Um, students are not allowed to be reclassified um, until the end of first grade anyway by state law. Um, so they can't be reclassified in kindergarten. Um, which was the other reason I didn't include kindergarten in my analysis. It's actually a very small portion of students. I can show you a graphic at the end in terms of the proportion. Um, it's, it's one of those trade-offs I had to make. I thought about that a lot, actually, um, because there are students who are reclassified in first and second grade. Um, but in order to model the role that these achievement assessments are playing, those start in third grade. And so that's why I chose to start my analysis in third grade. Is that a coincidence that in Texas, the third grade is the first state assessment that actually counts. So a coincidence in terms of? Like just that that's when they, that's when they start, you said that's when they start reclassifying. Well they start reclassifying in first and second grade, end of first grade and second grade, but it's just a very small number of students who are reclassified. I mean I think that a lot of that makes sense when we think about um, how long it takes students to learn a language. Um, People who study language and language acquisition would argue that it takes five to seven years at least for a child to acquire academic English language proficiency. Not conversational, not playground language, but academic English language proficiency. So it would make sense that we see only a handful of students being reclassified in first and second grade. That will be very dependent on the district and the sure. region. Sure. Yes, absolutely. It depends very much on the characteristics of the students who are there. Yeah. And, and the regional policies. Yes, yes, the demographics, absolutely. Um, so the uh, longitudinal event history analysis sample that I include, you can see my sample is declining over time. The reason for that is because students are exiting. Um, so don't, don't worry, I'm not losing students left over, you know, hand over fist. Um, and uh, you can see the number of students who are reclassified in each of these years who experience the event of interest, which is reclassification. And maybe to answer your question, sir, I could include in this graphic in the future first and second grade just to get at that. That's a great point. Um, this is just some basic descriptives. I know that this is a lot of text on here, but I just wanted to sort of paint a picture of the students who are English language learners who, included, who are included in my sample. A couple of uh, things to point out. Um, Spanish is overwhelmingly the language that's spoken. 93% of the students are Spanish speakers. Um, 8% of the students are special education, 5% are gifted. The vast majority of instruction is in is a bilingual um, instructional setting. There are a handful of parents who are students who are parent denials, approximately 7%. Um, by and large, these students tend to be clustered in schools where there's a high proportion of students who are English language learners and a high proportion of economically disadvantaged students. Um, and as is the case with immigration in general, uh, it's a highly urban phenomenon. So the vast majority of these, well, the majority of these students are in urban and suburban settings. I also included these three regions because these three regions account for more than 50% of the English language learners in the state of Texas. So just to highlight those three. Uh, so this is the survival um, function. So there are two important distributional functions within event history analysis. The survival function is the probability that a unit will, quote, survive um, or fail to be reclassified longer than a specific point in time. So as you can see, there's quite a big drop in third grade. Remember, the first year of my analysis is third grade. There's quite a big drop. I think that has to do with um, the goal that is set by the state that students should be reclassified within three years of entry. I think that's a big part of this. I think a lot of it is also just language acquisition in general. But so you can sort of see these, these stair steps and how, how this process looks over time. Um, this is, a, again, another survival function, but instead it's broken down 
by whether or not the child met tax proficiency standards in the year. So a couple of interesting things to note, the blue line is if they met tax proficiency standards that year. So you can see that the rate of survival or the rate of exiting ELL status is much steeper. So students are more likely to be reclassified faster if they're meeting tax proficiency standards, which makes sense. That, that agrees with the, the state policy. But one of the things that's very interesting is this red line here, which indicates that there are a number of students who are being reclassified even though they have not met those standards that are set by the state. Again, one more survival function. This time it's broken down by language group. Um, so you can see that the green line is students who speak a language other than Spanish or English. Um, so this would include Asian languages, this would include Middle Eastern languages, um, so on and so forth. So you can see that the rate of reclassification for, the, for that group of students is faster. Uh, just to very quickly explain uh, my model, um, which is a whole bunch of Greek, but um, in essence, the primary dependent variable of interest is the hazard rate, which is lambda sub it. Um, and this is the latent variable of the underlying risk process for an event occurring. And so the hazard function represents the instantaneous rate of change of the probability of experiencing uh, reclassification at a specific point in time, conditional upon having not experienced that event previously. Um, just to flesh out the model, these are the different bins of variables that I had mentioned earlier that are included. English proficiency ratings, achievement proficiency, so on and so forth. So to get, go ahead and get into the results. So for the sake of brevity, I've only presented significant results um, in my paper. I have obviously everything presented. Um, but what's interesting to note here is that the hazard of reclassification, if you look down, if you look at the exponentiated coefficient here, think about it as a factor that has a multiplicative effect on the hazard. So if it's greater than one, that means a child is more likely to be reclassified and it's happening faster if you want to think about it that way, if it's less than one, it's happening at a slower rate. So in this case, all of these um, variables are um, greater than one, meaning all of these uh, variables contribute to a student being reclassified faster. So if they met tax proficiency standards, they're about 60% more likely to be reclassified at a given point in time. I think that this is very interesting. If the child took the tax test in English, which is what the policy says um, should be happening, um, that these students are about 10 times more likely to be reclassified at a given point in time, which maybe should get us to start thinking about um, whether or not students are, well, to get us to start thinking about carefully about making decisions as to whether the child should be tested in English or in Spanish, if children are that much less likely to be reclassified in English net of their actual English proficiency scores, if that makes sense. When we look at um, student characteristics, I think it's also interesting, remember I've controlled for, I've netted out English proficiency and achievement at this point, and there are a number of student characteristics that still matter um, in this process. So for example, um, students who are in special education are about 89% um, as likely, so they are less likely uh, to be reclassified um, at a given point in time. So students who are special education are slower to be reclassified, whereas students who are gifted are faster to be reclassified. In terms of looking at the school context, I think a number of these variables um, up at the top are sort of the magnitude is too small to even really discuss them, but I presented them since they were significant. But this is interesting, that students who attend charter schools are less likely to be reclassified than their peers who attend traditional public school settings. Um, I do actually do a lot of work um, studying charter schools. I was a charter school teacher when I taught in California. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that is, um, but I think that it may be that a number of charter schools are new um, and that charter schools are not familiar with how this process works. Um, and frankly, a lot of times charter schools don't have the resources um, that are available to traditional public schools in terms of support coming from the district and so on and so forth. So they may be m making these decisions in a different way. It's also interesting to note that students in rural contexts are um, slower to be reclassified, and suburban contexts for that matter. The, the reference group here is urban. When looking at the regions, okay, a lot here. Um, my reference group was the Rio Grande Valley, Edinburgh. 
Um, I use that as my reference group because they have the highest proportion of English language learners in the state of Texas. So just to sort of tease this out, all of these, dist all of these regions that are listed here are significantly different from Edinburgh. The two districts that have the slowest reclassification rate, 0 0.62, 0 0.62 here, also have a very small number of English language learners. So I think that that's interesting, just to sort of point that out. These three districts that are the fastest, two of them also have a very small number of English language learners. El Paso, I would almost call an outlier. I need to figure out what's, what's going on here in El Paso in terms of their re rate of reclassification, because they have a high number of English language learners, but they're also being reclassified at a very fast rate. So um, just to sort of wrap things up here, um, I wanted to mention that I think one of the things that's interesting to point out with this study um, is that there are a number of students who are long-term English language learners. So these are students who have been in U.S. schools, in Texas schools, from first grade all the way through seventh grade. They have not left the state of Texas. Um, and these are students, uh, it's about 16.3%, 16.4% of these students are still classified as English language learners at the end of middle school. Um, and I don't think that people are very aware of that. I think that generally, by and large, uh, teachers, when you talk to them, um, if they teach you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and they have English language learners, the impression is that these students came in later, um, at some point later during their educational trajectory, when in fact about 16% of them are still not reclassified by the end of middle school. And I think that that's something that we need to start thinking a little bit more deeply about. Um, the second thing, it's very clear that there's some sort of bending of the rules that's happening. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think that that's actually sort of the next uh, piece of, of the study that I would like to, to look at, where we have these students who are being reclassified who have not met the criteria that the state sets. They've not passed the tax in reading. They've not taken the tax in English, so on and so forth. And that these, these students are, I'll call, you know, I call them, you know, they're, they're bending the rules. Um, or their teachers are bending the rules in terms of making these reclassification decisions. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing for the students, but I think that that's a next step is to really look and say, okay, so for students who are not, uh, who are being reclassified when according to state policy they should not, is that having a positive influence on their academic achievement down the road or is it having a negative influence? Let me go back here for just a sec. Can't you exit without passing tax if you score about the 40th percentile on a non-reference test? No. Not anymore? No. They could a while back, but four or five years ago. If, if with the tax test, and I know that the requirements have shifted under STAR, period. They've changed, actually. Um, but you must have passed. Maybe if you were a special education student and had an exemption not to take the tax test, but if you took the tax test, including the tax modified, um, then you had to pass that test in English to be reclassified. The probability of scoring 40th percentile or greater on a norm reference test and not passing the test mm -hmm. is very low. Right. Right? So. You would think that they would be I mean, very strongly not, related. We, we know what happens. Right. But, if, but, uh, but in a case where you had a child who was special needs who was not taking the tax test to begin with, that's when those tests come into play. Now, those tests are what are used in order to make those decisions with listening and speaking because that's, again, a, a state, uh, a, a, an assessment selected from a list of the state assessments. See, you, to pass the tax, depending on the grade level, you had to be at least around the 20th or 25th percentile. That's right. So if requirement for exiting is passing the tax, mm -hmm. there will be some kids that will never be, get beyond the 20th right. percentile. That's right. So that 16% number may be good. The which percent number? 16% of the kids that are still... That are still there? They are after in middle school. Okay, so, and I, and I, and I understand that, but I think that one of the things that I would, I would say is that um, I again go back to whether or not these type of assessments should be being used to make these decisions. The tax reading test is designed to measure literacy. It's not designed to measure English proficiency. So if that's what we're using, and I agree, and probably the reason that they haven't made it is because they haven't passed that test, right? But should that be the metric that we're using? Um, let me just go ahead and skip this. I know I'm getting close on my time. In terms of um, recommendations, I, I really think that a simple uh, policy recommendation um, would be to really consider the way that we're labeling English language learners. When you think about um, the English language learner classification, it incorporates 
just this huge variety of students, students who are very close to acquiring English proficiency, students who just came in from a refugee situation and have had no formal schooling in their native language or in English. It's a vast classification. And one thing that might shift the way that we look at English language learners would be to include the number of years that they've been incorporated in Texas schools as part of their classification. So for example, just ELL-2 would tell you that that child had been in the state of Texas for two years. ELL-7 would tell you that they've been there for seven years and that maybe we need to really focus on an intervention um, for, for those children. The other um, key uh, aspect of, of recommendations that I, I would, I would like to think about is this idea of teacher recommendations and how they come into play in this process. So we know that teacher recommendations are allowed to come in, that's in the state policy, but there's no guidelines in terms of how teacher recommendations factor into this equation. So I would imagine um, that in a school setting where you have five ELLs, teacher voices are going to play a much stronger role in terms of recommendations for individual children than in a school setting like where I taught in South Texas, where virtually 100% of our students were English language learners when they came in the door. We don't have time <laughs> to ask every teacher for their recommendations, and so what we do is we use the numbers that are on paper. So you can, you can see how those, uh, the teacher recommendations come into play in very, might come into play in very different ways. Um, I think that the work that I've done here uh, makes contributions to several different areas. Um, the first is the access and equity uh, literature. I think I contribute in that respect by modeling this idea of time to reclassification. If we know that when a child is reclassified is important, it's important to know what leads up to when that child is reclassified. So that's part of the contribution that I make. Um, in terms of the measurement and assessment literature, uh, the achievement versus English proficiency assessments, I think that one of the things that this shows is that both achievement tests as well as English proficiency scores are influencing this process. And that's important to think about when we know that these tests, uh, achievement tests, are not being designed to assess English proficiency. Uh, thinking about a policy contribution, I think this is a great case of state policy meets local influence, where you have this state policy that's on paper, and then you have decisions that are being made at the local level, and they don't always align. Uh, looking at a methodological contribution, this idea of using event history analysis to measure a learning process is very new. Um, event history analysis is generally used more to look at policy diffusion and in medicine it comes out of biostatistics. And so I think that this is a novel application um, of this uh, specific method. Um, just to mention limitations, um, obviously this analysis only includes data from one state. So while it's very relevant in this context, and I think that there are some important um, questions that this generates that could be used to design other studies in other states, this is only one state. We know that Texas is very special, and Texas can be also very different than other states. Um, and uh, also, as you mentioned, uh, I'm unable to model this idea of early reclassification. That's something that is a limitation of this study. I also do not have access to the specific teacher recommendations that are made, um, the actual conversations that are taking place. As I mentioned, um, there are a couple of things that I'd like to look at in terms of future research. One of uh, my ideas is to look at, take a closer look at these, quote, non-compliers, these students where there's some bending of the rules taking place. So what happens to these students down the road if they're being reclassified and according to state policy, that's not what should be taking place? Is this a good thing for these students? Is it a bad thing? Does it depend on the region? Things like that. Um, and then also I think it would be important to follow up doing some qualitative work um, on reclassification at the region, district, and school level. Um, when we see these sort of regional effects, these regional differences, I think it's important to start talking to some of the people at the regional level to really figure out, you know, try to figure out, tease out what some of these differences might be that's causing, for example, El Paso to be as fast as they are to reclassify um, their students. So I will just stop there, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. That is my email address. Please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I'm happy to talk via email or, or via phone. So just let me know. Okay, well, Madeline will be around for a minute or two after the seven. That's right. Depending on what 
to speak with her. Um, so I'd like to thank Maddie for, for coming, presenting to us, and, and also to all of you for, uh, for taking the time to, to attend the presentation. Uh, the presentation has been videotaped and will be on our website in April. Uh, our next seminar will be on April 20th and will be in this room at the same time. And if you aren't currently on our communications list, uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, outside the front door. If you'd, if you'd leave us with your email address, we'll make sure that you get notices of, of future events here. Um, so thanks once again. And uh... Thank you. And I'll be around if you have questions. <laughs>